I will talk about this uh, topic. It's something that we, in our group, we are working on. Uh, we have been working on for quite a long time. And uh, this work stems from a cooperation that we have with two groups in the US. The group by Rich Gross, uh, uh, formerly at New York Polytechnic and now at Fresenlair Polytechnic. And uh, with the group of Zhao Zhong Jiang at Yale, he was a former postdoc with Rich Grass. And uh, we cooperate with them. They are the people synthesizing the polymers, and we are the people doing the characterization and the correlation between properties and structure. Uh, just to have an idea, there are many different enzymes that can be used to produce polymers. Uh, as you see, uh, hydrolases, lyases, uh, isomerases, etc. I will focus on lipases uh, that were used by our co-workers co to produce essentially polyesters. And uh, by the use of lipase, uh, you can <coughs> use them both uh, in ring opening polymerizations and in polycondensations. Uh, in uh, uh, the lipase that was used was uh, lipase B from Candida Antarctica. And uh, various types of monomers can be incorporated, not only to produce copolyesters, but also carbonates, esteramides, amino esters, etc. I will have no time to go into detail in uh, all these categories. I will try to, to pass some information, uh, concentrating on one special monomer, which is pentadecalactone. Pentadecalactone is a very large lactone. By means of a classical chemistry, it is very difficult to obtain high molecular weight macromolecules, whereas using enzymes, this is quite easy. You can obtain uh, uh, polymers with a, a number average molecular weight, about uh, 60 or 70,000. It is a highly crystalline polymer that melts around 100 degrees centigrade and has quite a large amount of crystallinity. This is the enthalpy of fusion. Several years ago, uh, at the beginning of this work, uh, we determined the crystal structure of this homopolymer, polypentadecalactone. We determined the unit cell parameters and uh, the, we showed uh, that uh, the polymer crystallizes in planar zigzag conformation and has a unit cell which is quite similar to that of polyethylene. The A and B parameters are very close to those of polyethylene. Concerning the properties of this uh, uh, long uh, uh, repeating unit uh, polyester, polypentadecalactone, as you see here from the stress strain uh, curves, uh, we can say that it behaves rather similarly to low-density polyethylene with a very uh, large strains at break, um, well above 100%. And we can say that uh, it is a polyethylene-like polymer but with isorolyzable ester groups along the chain. It means that uh, we can think about uh, uses similar to those of where low-density polyethylene is a good polymer, but we have these extra ester groups that can allow for degradation via hydrolysis after a long time because it is highly crystalline, but it is anyway a plus that can be considered for, for example, uh, environmental applications. Uh, we use the pentadecalactone to produce copolymers with smaller lactones. And we selected uh, smaller lactones, in particular caprolactone, virolactone and propiolactone in order to obtain a, a manner to change the ratio of methylene to ester groups in order to densify or to take apart these uh, hydrolyzable groups and to change the hydrophilic to hydrophobic character of our copolymers. <coughs> I will uh, exemplify what we obtained uh, by uh, talking about the pentadecalactone caprolactone copolymers, but what I will say is valid also for the other systems. Uh, we may <coughs> anticipate that, <coughs> sorry, since pentadecalactone is much more reactive than caprolactone in these ring opening polymerizations, we would expect to have some blocky kind of copolymers. 
Instead, what we find is completely random comonomer distribution. Why? Because the enzyme is not only able to catalyze the reaction, but also to catalyze transesterification reactions. Therefore, we have reshuffling of the units along the chain, and at the end, we have a totally random carbonomer distribution. We proved this also starting with the extreme case of the PDL monomer and the already formed high molecular weight polycaprolactam. By reacting them together, we obtained a totally random copolymer. So this transesterification reaction works very nicely. What we obtained and when we characterized polymers, as you see, these are cooling experiments in the calorimeter. You see nice uh, crystallization exotherms all the way around by changing composition, even at 50-50 composition. When you heat up again such copolymers, you see a nice uh, melting endotherm with high associated enthalpy. This means that we have high crystallinity in random copolymers all over the range. This is a very unusual behavior. What we are taught when we, when we learn uh, polymer science is that uh, when you have a random copolymer, when you add randomly foreign units in your original homopolymer chain, you introduce a disorder, a structural disorder in your chain, and at the end, in the around the 50-50 composition, you lose completely the possibility to crystallize. Instead, in this case, you have high crystallinity all over the <coughs> composition range. And if you plot the melting temperature, you see that it, it decreases very smoothly from that of polypentadecalactone homopolymer to polycaprolactone. And this is the typical behavior that you have when you have isomorphous substitution. It means that the two monomer units enter the same crystal lattice, and this crystal lattice smoothly changes from this typical of one homopolymer to that of the other one. Why does this happen? These are diffractograms, uh, wide angle X-ray diffractograms, where you can see, and here you have the unit cell parameters of the two homopolymers, the, the two unit cells are very similar. Compare these numbers of the A and B parameter, they are very, very close, and very close to those, of, as I said, of polyethylene. So the two polymers crystallize in a very similar crystal lattice, and it is possible to have this isomorphous substitution of the, of the monomers in the same type of uh, uh, lattice. What I, uh, what I showed for the case of caprolactone copolymers also happens when the second monomer is valorolactone or propylactone. So we obtain co-crystallization in all those systems. And this is a very specific uh, characteristic of this pentadecalactone, as I will show, to help other monomers to enter its own crystal lattice. What we obtained in these uh, copolymerizations is that we could change the ester group density and therefore the hydrophilic to hydrophobic character without losing crystallinity, that is preserving good mechanical properties, something that usually if you lose crystallinity it doesn't happen. Uh, this is the last poly copolymer of the series where more recently we could obtain copolymers, random copolymers with the, the shorter possible unit, which is glycolic acid unit. We only uh, investigated a small range of compositions up to about 30% of glycolic units, but we obtained high crystallinity all over the range, this range, and our colleagues in the U.S. prepared the nanoparticles with the intent to use them as uh, nanocarriers for drugs, that is for drug delivery because this is a very interesting system where we can tune the hydrophilicity because we have a very hydrophobic unit and a very hydrophilic one. So by changing composition, this thing can be nicely modified. Uh, some other copolymers that use the pentadecalactone unit and another uh, cyclic unit. This is dioxanone. Copolymers with dioxanone were produced uh, over the whole composition range from 20 to 84 mole percent of dioxanone we had and the 
uh, distribution of the co-units is very close to random. Uh, in this case, the behavior is uh, different from the ones I illustrated, where we had isomorphic system. Why? Because these are, again, X-ray diffraction patterns for the two homopolymers. This is PPDL, this is PDO. You can see just by eye that the, the, the reflections don't fall in the same, exactly in the same position. Why? Because the unit cells are quite different. So these are two homopolymers with different unit cells. I wouldn't expect to have isomorphic substitution. But still, with increasing DO content, dioxanone content over the whole composition range, I find a very high crystallinity. These are the percentages of crystallinity, even in the middle composition range. But there is something different from the case I illustrated before. As you see, we have the same kind of, of reflections up to a certain amount of DO. The, the DO type of crystallinity here, and in the case of this composition, I have all reflections pertaining to the two types of crystals. If I plot the melting temperature, as a function of composition. Here I have the homopolymer pentadecalactone on the other side, the polydioxanone. What I find is that I have a system that is called isodimorphic because I have two different types of crystals depending on the composition. And I have a composition that is called pseudo-eutectic composition where I have the coexistence of the two crystal phases. I have high crystallinity all over the composition position, but with two different types of crystals. Last uh, example of this series, another cyclic structure, trimethylene carbonate. Trimethylene carbonate was uh, copolymerized with pentadecalactone only at 50-50 composition, and what we found is that with increasing uh, reaction time, at the beginning we have a blocky structure, but with increasing reaction time, instead of having a tendency to go to a random uh, sequence, we tend to have a, an alternate sequence. So the, we start blocky and with increasing reaction time it goes towards alternating. Uh, also in this case we found that with increasing amount of alternate sequences a new crystal phase comes up and always high crystallinity, but with a new crystal phase corresponding to crystallization of the alternate pentadecalactone trimethylene carbonate units. Again, a quite unusual crystallization behavior. So, summarizing this part, PDL copolymers are all highly crystalline. We show that in the case of copolymerization, random copolymerization with smaller lactones, we have isomorphic substitution, crystallization in a common lattice. In the case of copolymers with dioxanone, we have an isodimorphic system, so crystallization in either PPDL or PDO lattice depending on the composition. And in this last case, we have of pentadecalactone trimethylene carbonate copolymers, we tend to have high crystallinity and with increasing alternate sequences, this alternate sequences crystallize in a new crystal phase. A few properties of these polymers. Uh, the thermal stability increases with increasing PDL. I mean, if you see pen, uh, a PDO with dioxanone is not very highly stable. These are thermogravimetric curves. And if you make the copolymer with PDL, you have an increase in instability. Same thing happens with polytrimethylene carbonate. The copolymers with PDL tend to show a higher uh, thermal stability. Mechanical properties. Here is only, uh, only a few curves just to illustrate that if this is the homopolymer, these are two different copolymers just chosen by me to show you that you can have good mechanical properties acceptable with a, a, an elastic modulus that changes. You see that the, the slope of the first part, which corresponds to rigidity of the material, tends to change. And we can tune it. How? By changing the crystallinity. So we can select compositions and co-monomers that provide different amounts of crystallinity. They are all crystalline, but with different amounts of crystallinity. And this 
plays an important role on the type of values of elastic modulus that you obtain. So you can obtain different uh, values and you can play on that. What about biomedical applications? Why were we thinking about biomedical applications? Because dioxanone, trimethylene carbonate and caprolactone, some of the co-monomers that we have been using, are broadly used for uh, biomedical applications. So we thought, OK, we, we made the copolymers with P pentadecalactone. Nobody analyzed the biocompatibility of polypentadecalactone. So we analyzed it. And we could show, some years ago, that uh, via indirect cytotoxicity tests, it is uh, acceptable, it is biocompatible. And so we also had some cells growing on a scaffold made of polypentadecalactone. As you see, after 14 days, you still see some scaffold in the, behind the cells, then after 27 days the cells cover totally the scaffold. So also the cell adhesion and proliferation was good. Uh, I showed you a scaffold made uh, via electro spinning. Why? Because our group, um, we are quite expert in electro spinning. We could uh, uh, electro span many different uh, polymers and copolymers. And this is a sort of a scaffold that uh, is called biomimetic because uh, uh, the, the size of these fibers and the organization in the space that can be modified at will uh, is, uh, mimics uh, somehow the, the collagen fibers. Uh, and so the idea was to obtain scaffolds for tissue engineering with tunable bioresorption rates. Why it is important to tune those bioresorption rates? Because the cells are grown in vitro but after that, they have to be <laughs> transferred with the scaffold supporting them in vivo. And in vivo, what must happen is that this, the scaffold the sustaining the cells must degrade with a, in a time scale that is compatible with the kinetics of reconstruction of the tissue in vivo. That is, the cells have to... Uh, secrete the extracellular matrix that will substitute the, uh, the scaffold we provided to the cells in vitro and the time of the degradation of our scaffold and of the growth of the extracellular matrix must match. So we must be able to tune the biodegradation rate of the scaffold. Uh, as you see, for example, here we see that we have polymers that have, these are contact angle measurements on a film of the different PDL copolymers. We have uh, uh, drops of water that have a different contact angle. The smaller the angle, the more hydrophilic is the polymer because the, the drop just sits nicely on the surface. Therefore, we can change the hydrophilicity and by, by this we can tune the hydrolytic degradation rate. Uh, of course, another thing that can tune that rate is to change the dimension of the fibers because you, you change the surface offered to hydrolysis. You can change the porosity. You can do many, many things. You can also make uh, scaffolds by other means. And this is something that we did some time ago with one of those uh, copolymers. So we prepared the scaffolds through uh, supercritical CO2 foaming. These are scaffolds for other uh, purposes, for example, for bone substitution or for cartilage substitution. They must be three-dimensional and have a, a, a suitable porosity. And we could uh, tune the mechanical properties of the scaffold, getting good scaffolds for substitution of the cartilage by tuning the crystallinity of the polymer and uh, the porosity. This can be done by playing on the, on the uh, uh, experimental parameters for the CO2 foaming. Just a curiosity here, uh, as I told you at the very beginning, it is possible to obtain also uh, carbonate coesters. This is a, a very uh, strange system because it is a very disordered one from the point of view of the mi microstructure. I think that we have an AB monomer, which is pentadecalactone, an A2 and a B2 monomer. They are totally randomly distributed along the chain, and the AB can be AB or BA. 
So from the point of view of the microstructure, it is a very disordered system. We would expect not finding high crystallinity, high order in the organ conformation and organization of the chains. Nevertheless, they are all highly crystalline. And uh, we even find out a new crystal phase we detected that was unknown. Uh, so again, their polymers containing this pentadecalacton unit tend to crystallize very, very easily. Final thing that I would like to tell you very quickly, we also used some of those uh, polymers made uh, uh, via uh, the use of enzy enzymatic synthesis to obtain carriers for non-viral gene delivery. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this technique. I mean, uh, to introduce uh, DNA in the nucleus, uh, usually they use uh, polycations. Uh, so the positive charges can complex the negative charges on the DNA. And this is the means to introduce the DNA in the cell and then in the nucleus. However, there is a problem concerning these polycations. Uh, it seems that they have a level of cytotoxicity that is not very much acceptable for this kind of work. They work perfectly, but uh, they are cytotoxic somehow. So the idea is to go for uh, polymers that don't have neat charges, but they can complexate anyway. So what we have been doing quite recently is to analyze several kinds of uh, such polymers, I only show you an example. Here you have a, gly a glycol that contains a tertiary amine. It is terpolymerized with a di, let's say, acid and a lacton. The lacton was chosen with different size. So we went from the smaller one, which was caprolacton, to the largest one, which was hexadecalacton. The reason for this was to tune hydrophobicity. So by changing the dimension of the lactone, you introduced a longer, or long or short stretches of methylene carbons, and therefore you could change the hydrophobicity of the whole thing. Then we had the very all different compositions, so different lactones and different compositions. And uh, the distribution was again random using the enzyme catalysis. Very easy composition, control of the compositions. This is an example with one lacton, the pentadec lacton we already know. As you see, the feed is very well reflected in the real composition at the end. So this technique allows you to decide the kind of composition you want just playing on the feed. And depending, of course, on the lacton content, you go from hard solids to oxygluy materials by changing the composition. Uh, by changing type of lactone, large or small, and, and amount, you can change hydrophilicity, as you see, hydrophilic and more and more hydrophobic. And since uh, hydrophobicity seems to play a very important role in the efficiency of the transfection, which was the aim for the production of such polymers, we chose the most hydrophobic third polymers, and uh, our colleagues in the US prepared nanoparticles, they were loaded with DNA, and they did preliminary experiments of gene transfection, and the results were very encouraging. So it seems that you can also use, you don't need to use polycations, you can use uh, polymers with amine groups and obtain very good results, not having the problems of cytotoxicity. So let me conclude, because I'm afraid I'm late. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, conclusions. For PDL copolymers, they all show high crystallinity. This seems to be due to the ability of this long stretch of PDL that uh, crystallizes in planar zigzag conformation to take in its own uh, uh, lattice, incorporate other monomers. This allows to obtain copolymers with tunable crystallinity degree, hydrophilicity, and mechanical properties. And as I showed you a few cases, examples proposed uh, applications in the field of biomaterials with desired uh, reabsorption properties. Uh, we also analyzed many different types of copolymers. I only showed you an example of carbonate and an example of amino esters. Also in this case, a high crystallinity uh, with a melting temperature that changes with composition. 
The properties can be easily tailored by controlling the composition and composition can be controlled by feed, so in a simple manner. And the materials can go from rigid to glue-like, uh, all the way through waxy, etc. Acknowledgements. I have to acknowledge uh, the people who has be, have been working with us uh, in my group uh, over the years in these uh, studies. The whole, the whole Rich Grass Group in South Zhongjiang and all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. <clears throat>